time. What is it? All that is and all that was and all that is to be lies within this dimension that we know as time. Of course, time is made up of three distinct parts. The past, the future, and then each of us experiences life on a brief razor-thin slice of it called the present. An ever-sliding moment between two seeming eternities, from the far reaches of the distant past to the horizon of a never-ending mysterious future. As far as we know, mankind is limited to moving only forward through time, never backwards. But what if it were possible for a person to escape the bonds of time, to stop it in its tracks, and maybe even move around within time at will? What would you do? Where would you go? Would you travel to the distant past to view the building of the pyramids? Maybe witness firsthand the birth of Jesus. Or perhaps even go back in time to prevent the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Then on the other hand, what would you do if you could transport yourself into the future? To go forward to any moment in time and to discover in advance the outcome of every decision you can make. To step out of the dimension of time and space and have a good look around. Who wouldn't want to do that? What would you do with that kind of power? Is this just a wild fantasy? Well, maybe not completely. In the early 20th century, Albert Einstein introduced to the world the theory of special relativity. When it was later tested and proven to be true, it revolutionized our understanding of time and space. Einstein discovered time can actually be slowed down or accelerated depending on how fast you move relative to something else. For example, an astronaut inside a spaceship flying away from the Earth at near the speed of light would age more slowly than a twin brother who remained on the Earth. By the time our space traveler returned, his Earth-bound twin would have aged many years by comparison to the time he aged while in space. The returning astronaut would feel as though he had traveled to the future. But what if there was a powerful being who is unbound by the constraints of time? A being with absolute power over time and space. And one who knows the future even better than you know your own past. Impossible? Well, what if I could prove it? I can with this book, the Bible. Within its pages are more than 2,000 distinct and verifiable predictions. If I were to tell you that over 1,800 of these prophecies have already come true, would you be interested in knowing more? Now, I want to be clear. The Bible is not an almanac revealing who will win the next World Series or a way to find those lucky lotto numbers. But it does answer the really important questions about our future and about your future. And while you might already know, the Bible is a book brimming with prophecy. Are you aware how accurate those predictions have turned out to be? Well, strap on your seatbelt, friend. You're about to find out. He removes kings and sets up kings. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. Kingdoms in time. In the beginning. See, the Bible does talk about time. Let's begin with maybe a little background. The Bible is actually a book comprised of 66 books written by about 40 different authors in three languages on three continents over a period of about 1500 years. Its writers came from all walks of life. They were shepherds, kings, priests, rulers, and fishermen. 
each with a unique personality. They also wrote from many different situations. Some were in prisons, others in palaces, some lived in caves, others were captives in foreign lands. Yet the Bible fits together into one cohesive story with a clear beginning, a constant theme, and a logical ending, all while surrounding a central character. Perhaps this is why the Bible is the best-selling book of all time, with over five billion copies sold and distributed. With that, let's take a look at our first prophecy. The Gospel book of Matthew records that in AD 30, Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem in great detail, 40 years before it took place. He pointed to the immense polished marble stones and columns, and he stunned the disciples by saying, Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. When Jesus made the prediction that there would be not one stone left upon the other of the temple, you can just imagine how the Jews of that time would have felt. This was a building project that had been going on for almost 100 years. Jerusalem is where the presence of God, the Shekhinah of God, was in the temple. I mean, God was there, literally there. And what you find with the temple is the largest building project ever undertaken in the Roman Empire. It was huge. The Colosseum in Rome, for example, it's on a footprint of about six acres. When you look at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, it's 36 acres, so it's six times the size. The disciples were astonished by this prediction because the temple was the crown jewel of the nation. It was constructed with tons of massive and precious stones. One foundation stone you can still see today is 41 feet long by 15 feet deep and it weighs more than 500 metric tons. That's more than 100 elephants. But Jesus' prophecy came true. According to the renowned historian Josephus, during the conquest of Jerusalem, when the Roman soldiers set fire to the temple, the extreme heat melted the abundant gold that adorned the place of worship. This caused the precious liquefied metal to seep into the cracks of the foundation stones. After the battle, the Roman soldiers came and toppled every single stone in order to recover the gold. As a result of the destruction, the treasury in the temple was used to mint Roman coins. It's called the Judea Capta coin, and there are hundreds of types and thousands of examples, usually in bronze, sometimes in silver, sometimes in gold, of a palm tree representing Judea and a, a woman sitting on the ground weeping, representing the Jews. They all had an inscription on there, Judea Capta, which means Judah is conquered. This generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. We know from the book of Numbers, chapter 32, verse 13, that a Bible generation is 40 years. Jesus made this prediction in AD 30. Exactly 40 years later, in AD 70, the temple was destroyed by the Roman forces. Amazingly, there's another biblical prophecy concerning the Jewish struggle with Rome that actually predates the time of Jesus. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down, a nation whose language you will not understand, a fierce-looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. They will lay siege to all the cities throughout your land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. And indeed, the Romans did swoop down on Jerusalem and they lay siege to the city. In harmony with Moses' prophecy, the Roman flags bore the image of eagles in flight blazing in the sun. Today, all that's left of the original temple complex is the outer structure that is known as the Wailing Wall. Interestingly, if you walk nowadays from the Wailing Wall down south, there is a road there that is full of toppled stones. You have these huge layers of just broken stones on top of each other that were thrown over and pushed over. Today there's no historical doubt at all that this was destroyed by the Romans. 
that it was destroyed in AD 70, that, that this culminated in that century, and that this was the end of a temple in Jerusalem. And that, to me, speaks to the validity of a prophecy given decades earlier by a person who knew that that was going to happen. Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The Temple Hill a mound overgrown with thickets. The Jewish people and the nation of Israel have a mind-boggling history. No other nation on earth has been so widely and frequently displaced, surviving multiple genocide attempts. These resilient people have made one amazing comeback after another, going on to reclaim their homeland and to thrive again. It's astounding that they have kept their unique language and identity even after nearly 2,000 years of slavery, persecution, and global dispersion. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. One thing that's remarkable is after the Romans uh, forbid them being there, after Christians forbid them being there, after Muslims, Jews have always returned to Jerusalem. Long before the state of Israel, at least by the 1870s, probably as early as 1860s or 1850s, the Jews were a majority population in Jerusalem, under the Ottomans. Why? Because that's where they wanted to go. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. In May 1948, the Jewish state was reestablished as an independent nation. And today, this comparatively small country has grown into a globally recognized nuclear power that leads the world in innovation and technology. Jeremiah 25 contains another astounding prophecy regarding the destruction of Jerusalem and its miraculous restoration. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. 600 years before the time of Christ, it was foretold that due to the nation's disobedience, Jerusalem would be conquered, the Jewish temple destroyed, and the people would be carried off as captives in Babylon for 70 years. This happened B.C. 607, when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, conquered Jerusalem. The king of the Jews, priesthood, and the nobles were taken from Jerusalem, from Judea to Babylon. We know they were there. They took their holy books with them, the five books of Moses, the other books. And in a way, this is where modern Judaism begins because they worshiped God in Babylonia, not in Jerusalem. So they carry God with them, the worship of God with them. The Babylonian Chronicles are a set of tablets and one particular tablet that is now at the British Museum in London. The 597 campaign by Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned by name and his conquering of Jerusalem and Judea is also recounted in that particular chronicle. The prophecy goes on to say that they would return and rebuild the city and the temple. Right on schedule, after 70 years of captivity in BC 537, the Persian King Cyrus conquered Babylon and in the first year of his reign, he issued a decree allowing the Jewish people to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the city. When King Cyrus, the Persian, becomes king, he issues a decree allowing the nobles and the Jewish people who are in Babylonia to return and to rebuild the temple. All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. In fact, catch this. In 1879, archaeologists unearthed the Cyrus Cylinder, which contains the Persian king's policy to repatriate conquered peoples like the Jews. 
The Cyrus Cylinder is one of the most amazing discoveries made in Babylon. It recounts Cyrus who comes into the city. He's welcomed by the people. He's regarded as a kind of savior, if you will, which is ironic given that he just conquered Babylon. Ezra gives us a very strong indication in the Bible that this was the time that the people were allowed to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild and to reestablish themselves in the land just as Jeremiah had predicted would happen after 70 years of captivity. Friends, we are about to delve into the most magnificent and undisputable Bible prophecy that proves the validity of Bible inspiration. In 10 amazing verses, containing only 340 words, this prophecy outlines the rise and fall of empires all the way from the time of ancient Babylon through to the second coming of Christ. One night, about 2,500 years ago, the powerful Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, fell asleep while contemplating the vast glory of his kingdom. As this grand architect of one of the world's most powerful empires drifted off into a restless sleep, he wondered what the future held for his kingdom. God took this opportunity to reveal to him through a vivid dream not only the ultimate fate of his nation, but also the rise and the fall of world empires from his day all the way to the end of Earth's history. In this amazing prophetic dream found in Daniel chapter 2, God showed Nebuchadnezzar a colossal statue with a head of gold, the chest of silver, thighs and belly of bronze, legs of iron, and the feet and toes mixed partly of clay and iron. Then suddenly, a huge stone plunged from the heavens and smashed the idol, pulverizing it into dust. And the stone? It grows into a gigantic mountain that fills the earth. Nebuchadnezzar knew this was no ordinary dream. So the troubled king called for his wisest counselors to come and relate to him the dream and explain its meaning. They, of course, were powerless to tell the king his dream. But then God gave the same dream and its interpretation to a Jew stationed in Babylon, a young man by the name of Daniel. He went before the king and presented the precise details of the dream and then gave the interpretation. In doing this, the Bible prophet divulged the next two millennia of world empires that would impact God's people. And so far, all of this has transpired just as predicted. Daniel told the king that the head of gold represented Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Babylon, which ruled the world from 612 to 539 BC, was one of the wealthiest and most powerful empires of antiquity. One that could aptly be described as the head of gold. Babylon was probably one of the most sophisticated, most opulent cities ever built up to that point in history. And Nebuchadnezzar, who was the longest reigning king in Babylonian history, really rebuilt the city as a showcase to the entire world. Most cities of the ancient world were really walled villages. Even Jerusalem in King David's time was really rather small. But Babylon was a city even by modern standards. The city of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrians, was a city of about 2.9 square miles. Rome was a city of about one square mile. You have Athens, which of course was a uh, philosophical capital, if you will, with 0.8 square miles. And then you have Babylon with four square miles. So that's, that's four times the size of Rome. And what we have really in this amazing city is some of the most incredible architecture. We have the city surrounded by eight gates, each named after a particular deity. The most famous, of course, is the Ishtar Gate, which is now in the Forda Asiatische Museum in Berlin. The Euphrates River flowed through the city. You also had walls surrounding the city. These were uh, double walls. The outer wall 22 feet thick, the inner wall 12 feet thick. So you had just a great polytheistic society, a great uh, civilization that was bent on conquering the world, and Nebuchadnezzar was really the power and the force behind that. Daniel explained to the king that Babylon would eventually fall as a world power and be replaced by another kingdom, 
one that's represented by the chest and the arms of silver. Led by King Cyrus in 539 BC, the Medo-Persian Empire conquered Babylon in a brilliant military maneuver. In one night, the immense city was conquered with its walls and gates still intact. Even more incredibly, the specifics of this victory were all foretold in prophecy over 150 years earlier. Herodotus tells us the story, actually. He tells us that after his horse drowned, Cyrus got furious with the river itself and decided to take that river, and he had his soldiers dig 540 channels to divert the river and to destroy the river from its flow. And in doing that, he actually accomplished something that would help him conquer the city of Babylon itself. And when the river was diverted, they were able to march in underneath the city walls because the river gates had been left open. They entered the city, overthrowing the world's mightiest nation. And that's what the army did. They marched in, they were able to open the top gates and totally conquer Babylon, which was unthinkable at that time. But that's what the prophecy had said would happen, and that's exactly what happened. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. 150 years in advance, Cyrus had been named. Here is the prophet Isaiah looking ahead and by, we believe, divine inspiration, naming the very person who would come in and conquer Babylon according to prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 44, we have this amazing prophecy where it says to the rivers, be dry, I will dry up your rivers, says the Lord. And to Cyrus, my anointed, my shepherd, he's the one that's going to accomplish this. So in this text, which dates 150 years before the event, you have already Isaiah predicting the very means by which Cyrus would take the city of Babylon, which is quite incredible when you think about biblical prophecy. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. The Persians, they worship one God. They are monotheists. They have that in common with the Jews and there may well be a spark of sympathy there. With Cyrus and his conquering of Babylon, it ushers in the Medo-Persian Empire period, which lasts from 539 all the way down to 331. When Medo-Persia came, it was almost as if there was a shift. They moved from gold to silver. Silver became the common currency. And while you'd had silver before in Babylon, they didn't have much use for it because they had so much gold. And silver became the currency that they used for trading with other nations. And that became almost the standard way of referring to Medo-Persia was the silver empire. After these shall arise another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. All Bible scholars agree that the brass kingdom in the image symbolizes Greece. They came into power when Alexander the Great conquered the Persians at the Battle of Arbella in 331 BC. Alexander the Great is often described as Greek, and strictly speaking, that was true. He had been trained under Aristotle. He was a very charismatic young ruler. His father, Philip II of Macedon, had been killed. And Alexander assumed power, and he immediately began to dream about fulfilling his father's goals, and that was to conquer the Persian Empire. Alexander the Great becomes king when he's only 18, but he's a military prodigy. Indeed, even today, Alexander the Great is a byword for military genius and military conquest. He would come up to a city, and they would say, why should we surrender to you? And one of the stories is that there was a city right on the edge of a cliff. And he told his men, I want you to start marching off the cliff to your death in the sea below. And the men obediently started marching off the cliff. And Alexander the Great said, if my men are this willing to be obedient to me, there is no way we cannot conquer your city. And that particular city just surrendered. <laughs> he was able to accomplish in a very short time what some people are not able to accomplish in a lifetime. And in a series of campaigns, after he was crowned king of Egypt, he continued heading to the east and he began to encounter 
the Persian king, Darius III. And Alexander doesn't pursue Darius who flees back east towards his heartland. Alexander turns south because he wants to occupy the coastal lands, today what would be Palestine and then Egypt. But to move forward, he has to conquer Tyre. They shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for spreading nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. For over a millennium, beginning in 1500 BC, the Phoenicians were the undisputed naval power of the ancient world. They created and controlled a vast array of trade ports throughout the Mediterranean Sea. And in fact, the Phoenicians are so known as experts that they are brought into the Red Sea ports. The Bible describes how Solomon gets mariners from the king of Tyre to take his fleets down the Red Sea. In 597 BC, the prophet Ezekiel predicted that every building in the city of Tyre would be toppled by an invading army. In fact, every stone would be thrown into the sea. Tyre was an amazing city during this time. It was one of the largest trade cities of that period. And here was this prophecy saying that the city would fall. Well, even Alexander the Great, it seemed, couldn't make it fall. He sieged it for seven months, but then he came up with a plan. So Alexander says, right, if they're out to sea, I'll just have to take the land to them. And he used the blocks of the old city, the big stones, threw them into the sea and built a causeway to be able to overcome the walls of the new city where the island was. And so then he can bring his army to bear. Tyre is stormed, utterly destroyed. That was an exact fulfillment of prophecy because prophecy had said that those stones would be cast into the sea and become a place where fishing nets were cast over. That's exactly what happened. Keep in mind, the idea that the Greeks would rule the world was a very bold prediction. Remember that at the time that Daniel's prophecy was given, Greece was just a collection of warring tribes with very little world influence. Greece remained in power till about 168 BC, when it was conquered by the next world power waiting in the wings. The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Who followed Greece? It's an undisputable fact of history that the Iron Monarchy of Rome conquered them and enjoyed supremacy for the next 600 years. Once iron is introduced, the fundamental effect, and especially military effect, is that the price of weapons goes down considerably. So the price of making an iron arrowhead, or an iron spear point, or an iron helmet, is much less than that of bronze. And mainly reason is that bronze contains tin, and tin can only be obtained in two places in the ancient world, Afghanistan, or what's today Afghanistan, and what's today Cornwall in England, and trading it made it very expensive. So the Iron Age lowered the price of war, which meant armies got bigger. Rome was violent, they were ruthless, they were determined to conquer everywhere they went, and they were like iron crushing everything in its way. When the Roman Empire began to crumble in AD 476, it was not overtaken by another single power. Instead, several barbarian tribes conquered Rome and carved up the nation, just as Daniel had prophesied. There were a lot of reasons why Rome lost its power. There were barbaric invasions from the north. There was a great deal of spending that Rome had done. Rome really dissolved. It had such inner problems. And as Rome disintegrated, we know of at least 10 tribes that came in and were able to take over portions of the Roman Empire. And that forced the emperor, Constantine, to evacuate Rome and to move to the east and to set up a new center for his empire called Constantinople. Ten of these original tribes evolved into the nations of modern Europe. They were known as the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Franks, the Vandals, the Alamanni, the Swedes, the Anglo-Saxons, the Heruli, the Lombards, and the Burgundians. Seven of them now still exist in Europe today. 
For example, the Anglo-Saxons became the English, the Franks became the French, the Alemanni became the Germans, and the Lombards became the Italians. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Through marriage, alliances, and treaties, many powers have vainly attempted to reunite the European continent. All throughout history, leaders such as Charlemagne, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, Mussolini, and Hitler fought to recreate the glory of the former Roman Empire. But haunted by the words of Daniel's prophecy, they shall not cleave one to another, they all miserably failed. As you might expect, many skeptics once argued that the prophecies of the statue in Daniel were so accurate it had to be written after the events. But the shocking find of a shepherd boy in 1946 changed everything. A little Bedouin shepherd boy was out with some of his friends herding some sheep and throwing rocks as boys are wont to do. He saw this opening in the rock, he was across from it, he took a stone and of course he threw it there and when it dropped into the cave he heard the sound of breaking ceramics which is quite distinct. And he found these jaws stuffed with scrolls in the back of this cave. He took one or two of them and he showed it to his family. They took it then to an antiquities dealer in Bethlehem. And from that it came to Jerusalem until finally someone recognized what they were and an expedition was done to the Qumran Caves. All in all, they, they found about a thousand different uh, manuscripts. There are complete scrolls, like the famous Isaiah scroll. They all date to about 250 BC to 70 AD. The Isaiah scroll was preserved all 66 chapters and is virtually the same as the book of Isaiah that we have today. There are no theological differences. There are no drastic historical differences. An archeologist went in and examined the Dead Sea Scrolls. He compared it with the Bible that we had. And when he looked at the evidence, he said, the Old Testament books are indeed as ancient and as accurate as we have claimed them to be. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and other finds provide irrefutable evidence that the prophecy of Daniel was written well before the events he foretold. Many times in the Bible, God has foretold the rise and fall of particular kingdoms so that when it does come to pass, we will know that he holds the future. For instance, the city-state of Babylon, her people and most of the world believed the city was indestructible. However, God predicted. Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. As we've already learned, Babylon fell from power by the hand of Cyrus, the Persian king. But did it ever rise again? When Saddam Hussein came to power in Iraq, he dreamed of rebuilding and repopulating the ancient city of Babylon. He wanted to do this to thwart the biblical prophecy and discredit the nation of Israel. He claimed that Babylon's great palaces and its legendary hanging gardens, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, would rise from the desert. But recent history shows how his plans vaporized during the first Gulf War in Iraq. And Babylon remains unbuilt to this day. Just a handful of tourists that are viewing the ruins. Located to the southwest of Israel on the banks of the world's longest river was the Kingdom of Egypt. With her great pyramids, colossal temples, and year-round farming, Egypt looked as though it would endure as a superpower throughout history. Yet, during the high point of Egypt's power, the Bible boldly predicted 
that the kingdom would never again hold a commanding position among the nations of the world. The prophet Ezekiel declared, I will bring back the captives of Egypt and cause them to return to the land of Pathros, to the land of their origin, and there they shall be a lowly kingdom. It shall be the lowliest of kingdoms. It shall never again exalt itself above the nations, for I will diminish them so that they will not rule over the nations anymore. Ancient Egypt was one of the longest known civilizations. For thousands of years, Egypt had dominated a huge part of the ancient world. Campaigns up into Canaan during the New Kingdom period, when pharaohs like Tutmosa III and Ramses II made huge names for themselves. Much earlier than this time, of course, we have the building of the pyramids, uh, very early in Egyptian history. But as Egypt continues, we find a decline in ancient Egyptian culture. And that decline uh, comes uh, over the course of dynasties, over the course of time. And finally, in the end, Egypt loses its prominence altogether. Today, Egypt is not what it used to be in ancient times. And one can see uh, still the pyramids standing there in this huge, vast metropolis of a city known as Cairo. Uh, but one often thinks about the ancients and what they achieved back then and how different it is today compared to that glorious time in Earth's history. The Assyrian Empire once ruled the Middle East, covering over half a million square miles. Their ancient capital city of Nineveh was situated on the eastern side of the Tigris River, just opposite of modern-day Mosul in Iraq. You might remember that following his three-day detour through the fish, the prophet Jonah was sent to warn the inhabitants of Nineveh to repent. While a revival was set in motion, it didn't last and Nineveh fell into a state of violence and immorality that would torment their Jewish neighbors. As a sign of God's judgment, in 615 BC, the prophet Nahum predicted in great detail the future destruction of Nineveh. For while tangled like thorns, and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble fully dried. This came to pass three years later in 612 BC at the hand of the Babylonians. Here are just a few highlights of Nahum's prophecy. Nineveh is laid waste, in part by heavy rains and flooding. The commanders of the army would flee, which happened. Fire would destroy the city, and most notable, the city would never rise again. Well, Nineveh as a city uh, is never rebuilt. The great ziggurat of Nineveh, palace of Nineveh, these were never rebuilt. Just to keep these predictions in perspective, the Bible prophets foretold the major cities like Babylon, Tyre, and Nineveh would be destroyed and never be rebuilt, and they were not. However, Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt 27 times, and it still endures to this day. Time and again, history has ratified the Bible. Furthermore, Virtually all of these names of Bible kings, generals, leaders have been confirmed and accepted by modern archaeology. But the real central focus of all Bible prophecy is a person. Jesus is the primary theme of Scripture. The Bible is His story. It begins and it ends with Christ. Therefore, we should not be surprised to find prophecies about the coming Messiah throughout the Old Testament. This might be a time for a quick visual. The Bible is really divided into two collections of books. The Old Testament contains 39 books covering the Law of Moses, the histories, prophecies, and sacred writings that took place before the birth of Jesus. The last collection of 27 books contains the New Testament. It covers the history of Jesus' birth, life, teachings, this is then followed by the writings of the apostles and the prophecies of Revelation. Incredibly, scattered throughout the Old Testament are more than 300 prophecies that foretell the coming of Christ, some with uncanny detail. Then in the New Testament, we find an astonishing account of the fulfillment of these prophecies. Now keep in mind, there are about 400 years that separate the end of the Old Testament from the beginning of the New Testament. I'd like to also underscore 
that we know with certainty from the discovery and dating of the Dead Sea Scrolls that all of this was written long before any of this ever happened. Now, let's take a moment and consider some of these incredible prophecies. Every year, over a billion Christians celebrate the birth of Christ. While according to the scriptures, it's unlikely that Jesus was actually born December 25th, it's very clear that his birth was foretold and expected. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Now amazingly, for this prophecy to come true, God would have to relocate Joseph from his hometown up in Nazareth and transport he and Mary 70 miles south to Bethlehem, the hometown of Joseph's family. History shows this census took place in or around 4 BC. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Not only did the Bible specifically predict where Jesus would be born, it indicates when he would begin his ministry. This time prophecy comes from the book of Daniel. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. First, keep in mind when calculating a Hebrew prophecy that a day actually symbolizes a year. This principle can be found in Ezekiel 4.6. That means the first seven weeks in 62 weeks or a total of 69 weeks, would really be understood to describe 483 years. That takes us to exactly 27 AD. This was the very year when Jesus was baptized at 30 years of age and began his ministry. Incredibly, this prophecy was given while the Jews were in captivity in Babylon over 500 years before the birth of Christ. A stunning fulfillment that never could have happened by chance. Many interpreters have seen that the day for the year principle is accurately borne out, especially by the 70 week prophecy. The prophecy said that it would be 69 prophetic weeks, which would be 483 years to the coming of the Messiah. In Luke chapter three, Luke is talking about the coming of John the Baptist. And he says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Tiberius began his reign, his sole reign, when Augustus Caesar died in 14 AD. You narrow down the time when John the Baptist began his ministry and then Jesus came and was baptized soon thereafter. You'll find that it comes to AD 27. The prophecy said to the coming of the Messiah. And the word Messiah in Hebrew means anointed one. Did any anointing of Jesus take place in AD 27? Well, yes it did. If you read Acts 10 verse 38, you find out that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah predicted that Jesus would be born of a virgin 700 years before it actually took place. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. So I want you to notice two remarkable things, a virgin birth and a birth in Bethlehem. These are things that Jesus could never have manipulated. Jesus could never have said, I'm gonna try and fulfill those prophecies because you can't choose how you're born or where you're born. And yet these two factors came true in Jesus' life. One Old Testament prophecy foretold that the Messiah's birth would be associated with a genocide event. A voice was heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Because of this violent attempt to take the life of baby Jesus, his parents were forced to flee into Egypt for safety. 
Then he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. And this was like the Jewish nation. They had gone into Egypt, and now they were to be called out of Egypt. And Jesus goes into Egypt, into exile, and then he's called out of exile. Without a doubt, some of the most amazing prophecies concerning Christ are the ones found in the book of Isaiah that precisely highlight the details of his ministry. These prophecies pointed to what Jesus actually did. He brought hope, he brought healing, he was a light to the Gentiles. He was somebody who was able to restore the blind, who was able to release people from prison. And he quotes from another passage in Isaiah, Isaiah 35, about the healing of the blind and the lame. And he says, now watch. And then he goes on and continues what he had been doing, healing the blind and the lame. He's undoing those curses from breaking the covenant. And he's going to restore them so that they will experience God's grace once more. Jesus revealed great power during his ministry, healing the sick, calming the storms, even raising the dead. Yet the Bible writers predicted and documented that in spite of his incredible power and authority, he would still be a meek and a humble servant, a worthy role model. For example, in Zechariah 9, verse 9, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 500 years before Jesus came, Zechariah had made a prophecy. He had said that a king would come riding in on a donkey, and that became a tradition. And so when he enters Jerusalem uh, with the crowds shouting Hosanna and laying their cloaks before him and palms, people would have understood because they would have thought, ah, Jesus is positioning himself as the king. He's about to launch a coup d'etat. But that was not the type of king Jesus was. Jesus seems to have chosen to ride on the donkey to declare that he was a king before he went to the cross. This stunning event was witnessed by thousands of people just a few days before the crucifixion of Jesus. And yet it could have been easily disputed. Yet the writer who witnessed the events writes it as history. Nothing is more compelling than the prophecies regarding the betrayal, the trial, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus. For one thing, the Old Testament foretold that the Messiah would be betrayed by a friend after sharing bread with him. As everyone knows, Judas betrayed Jesus right after the Last Supper. Jesus foretold that he would be betrayed. This really shocked his disciples. Somebody that's on the inner circle becomes a traitor and betrays that trust. Uh, there's a reason why people don't name their children Judas. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. In fact, the Old Testament actually predicted the exact price that would be paid to betray the Messiah. If it is good in your sight, give me my wages. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. This incredibly precise prediction goes even a step further. The prophet Zechariah foretold how the blood money given to betray Jesus would be used. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. When Judas realizes that Jesus is not going to release himself, remorse flows over him. He's, he's shocked at what he has done, suddenly realizes that uh, he's betrayed his master. So he goes back to the priests with the money. 
He says, I have betrayed innocent blood. And then they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. We fast forward to Jesus. There's Jesus standing in front of Pilate. He refuses to defend himself. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. The author of the universe is derided, is tormented, and yet he remains silent throughout in a way that, of course, strikes Pilate, the cynical Roman, as being extraordinary. This is like nothing he's ever encountered. Uh, it's very clear that Jesus goes to the cross voluntarily and that he sees his death and the gospel writers see his death as a fulfillment of salvation. A thousand years before crucifixion was even practiced, King David foretold how the Messiah would be executed. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. We find that Jesus is there on the cross with a group around him, taunting him, using the same words that we find in Psalm 22. We find that his clothes are divided. The intensity of the pain is literally unimaginable. It was designed to be that way. You were actually tortured to death. So if you were trying to finish off a movement, this is what you would do. And so it's remarkable that actually this isn't the end of the Jesus movement, it's actually the beginning. The good news, of course, about Jesus is that the grave could not hold him. As recorded in all four Gospels, for a period of 40 days following his death, hundreds of witnesses are documented as having seen and touched and heard the man who had been crucified and buried. When the women came back and said, we saw Jesus, they said, yeah, right, right, right. You know, they, they didn't believe them. Over and over, they didn't believe them until Jesus himself says, look, here's my hands, here's the nail prints, you know. Nobody else in history claims to have been resurrected from the dead. And we know how extraordinary it is because when the early Christians started to proclaim this, people found it absurd. Why would the disciples make such an outrageous claim, one that was completely unfamiliar, if it weren't true. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Incredibly, even the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, he makes a reference to the resurrection of Jesus and its influence on the people in his famous journal of Jewish history. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Messiah. And when upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross, those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. It's been an extraordinary journey, seeing how so many of the Bible's predictions have materialized perfectly. From the rise and fall of nations to the Messiah's ministry, we've discovered incontrovertible evidence that the Bible comes from the hand of one who is not restricted by time or space. That the Bible is a supernatural communication from God to man. But why is this so important? How does this apply to us today? Does the Bible have anything to say about the chaotic age in which we now live? The book of Daniel makes a profound prediction for the people in our time. The prophet said regarding the last days, Daniel shut up the words and sealed the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. It does not take a scholar to see that this has come true in ways that even Daniel never could have imagined. Just in one lifetime, 
knowledge has exponentially exploded beyond our comprehension. In medicine, agriculture, transportation, digital electronics, just imagine trying to explain doing a Google search on your cell phone to the Prophet Daniel. And what about running to and fro? After more than 6,000 years of travel on horseback, people can now jet around the globe at supersonic speeds. Our final prophecy will consider a forecast made by Jesus himself. About a week before his crucifixion, Jesus predicted, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Can you imagine the smirking response of the people in Jesus' day who are listening to this audacious prophecy? Who did Jesus think he was? Here was this poor, uneducated carpenter, born in a stable, never even wrote a book, with no political connections, predicting that his teachings were going to circle the globe. But what's even more extraordinary is the second half of this prophecy. Jesus tells us here, with no equivocation, that after the message goes to the world, then the end will come. Today, hundreds of satellites circling the planet provide almost instantaneous global communication through radio, television, and the internet. The gospel is streaming into all the world. Earlier in this program, we discussed Nebuchadnezzar's dream from Daniel chapter two of this great image. It represented the various world powers up to our time. And you recall, when the dream ended, there was a great stone that flies from the heavens and smashes the image on its feet and then grinds them to powder. Who does this stone represent? And what is this great power that knocks down the image? It's Jesus Christ, the rock of ages. All of history is now moving towards the dramatic conclusion when the Son of God is gonna return with power and glory. The fulfillment of prophecy reveals that we've almost reached the end of time. There's but one all-important question left to answer. Are you ready for the greatest event in the history of the planet? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Well, friend, you can be ready. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Come to him in prayer and ask him to forgive you of your sins and to save you. His promise is that he will. Then, instead of having a hopeless end, you can have an endless hope. But now is the time. Today is the day. Why don't you ask him right now?